I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Ether, a format here where I sit in the chair of wisdom and read your most interesting, informative, or even controversial comments so that everybody else can know your opinions. Uh, Aaron W. Miller writes about baseball during the war. Okay, cool. Hello, Indy. I originally sent this message via Facebook. They suggested that I contact you directly. Well, here you are. Congratulations on your awesome channel and show. I'm delighted that you have brought so much attention, excited, and awareness to the study of World War I. Just so you guys know, it's not a format where I just read compliments about myself. There's actually going to be content here. Uh, I also appreciate the focus that you have given to some overlooked campaigns, another frequently ignored aspect of the war. I've shown the Great War in my classes and shared it with several colleagues. I was hoping that you were going to do an episode on the 1918 World Series. Indy, I know from your Sunday Baseball series that you are also interested in the history of baseball. I personally find the impact the war had on baseball fascinating. I am an associate professor of history at Ivy Tech Community College in Columbus, Indiana. I earned my PhD in history at Miami University, where I wrote a dissertation, Glorious Summer, a cultural history of 19th century baseball, 1861 to 1920. That sounds very interesting. That is the period of baseball I actually like. Uh, I am currently rewriting my dissertation into a manuscript for a book. Here's my own research writing for that that you could use. Okay. World War I had a tremendous impact on the national pastime, that's baseball to Americans, and the 1918 World Series, as it had done with much of the American culture, including fashion, cigarette smoking, and shaving, the war would also have a dramatic effect on baseball. The war intensified patriotic and military themes of the national pastime. This was a trend that started before the war, when many thought that baseball was vital for physical strength and national security. The 1918 World Series was notable for a lot of reasons. This was at a time when baseball was a dominant form of entertainment with tremendous cultural power. It was the first time the Star Spangled Banner, later to become the national anthem, was played during the series. It was also interesting because it featured the Chicago Cubs and the Boston Red Sox, two franchises that would struggle for most of the rest of the 20th century. This was also near the end of the dead ball era, a time when the game was dominated by pitching instead of hitting. You know, well, trick pitches and things were legal, like spitballs, shine balls, the emery ball had been banned. You would use one ball for the entire game, so by the sixth or seventh inning, it would just be sort of a mush ball. And even if you were a great and powerful hitter, you could probably barely get it out of the infield. There were also no lights, and the balls would get dirty and stuff, so by the later innings of the game, you quite often couldn't even see the ball. Anyhow, that all ended in 1920 with a bunch of changes. The two teams scored only 19 combined runs in the entire six-game series. In addition to its historical significance, the 1918 World Series had players with some awesome names. I assume he means fame. Okay, famous ones, yeah. In addition to Babe Ruth, the most famous baseball name of all, uh, he played for the Red Sox, and the Red Sox featured Sad Sam Jones as a pitcher, Bullet Joe Bush as a pitcher, Stuffy McGinnis, first base, who had been part of the $100,000 infield for the uh, Athletics, until which their dynasty ended in 1914, uh, and Hack Miller as catcher. Uh, meanwhile, the Cubs roster included legendary power pitcher Grover Cleveland Alexander. Hall hang on a second, got to get back to Ruth. Since this is still 1918, Ruth was still a pitcher and an outfielder. He hadn't been converted to a full-time outfielder. And he hit, uh, I don't remember if it was 9 or 11 home runs in 1918, but he was the first pitcher and the only pitcher to lead the league in home runs that year. Okay, the Cubs included legendary pitcher Grover Cleveland Alexander, who did not play in the series. Now, that was a big problem for, for Chicago because in 1915, 16, and 17 with Philadelphia, Alexander had put together three straight 30-win seasons, which nobody since the turn of the 20th century, nobody else did. You know, nobody else had three 30-win seasons, and he'd put three together in a row. Um, they also had Bunyan Zyder, uh, Jim Hippo Vaughn of double no-hit fame, or no-hitter against another guy throwing a no-hitter fame, and Rowdy Elliott, catcher. In 1918, Major League Baseball attempted to play a full season. Baseball claimed it was an industry vital to the nation, important not only as a necessary diversion, but also as a physical training ground. Major League Baseball emphasized its contribution to the war effort, raising funds for allied causes and donating athletic equipment to soldiers. The National and American Leagues, those are the two leagues of Major League Baseball, also highlighted the game's patriotism and military value, 
Ball players went so far as to conduct military drills on the baseball diamonds, shouldering baseball bats as if they were rifles, and there's some great photographs of this. Baseball was also quick to note the contribution of famous players already serving, such as Hank Gowdy and Grover Cleveland Alexander. Gowdy was the first major leaguer to volunteer. He would also serve in the military during World War II, despite the fact that he was over 50 years old then. Despite baseball's best efforts to prove its importance to the war effort, it was not an exempted industry. Bowing to public pressure, baseball would have to comply with the government's work or fight rule, where all physically fit men must serve in the military or work in an industry vital to the war effort. Major League Baseball agreed to shorten the season. It would end after Labor Day in early September after playing only 140 games instead of 154 with the Fall Classic, that's the World Series nickname, to start soon after. Now, it's also interesting to note that during the 1918 season, communities began to relax their rules against playing baseball on Sundays. A lot of places it was still banned on Sundays then. Uh, I, he, I think this is in large part due to baseball's efforts to prove itself as a necessary morale booster and as a crucible for physical training. Could be. Uh, the series started September 5th, 1918. In Game 1, a band from the Navy performed the Star Spangled Banner during the seventh inning stretch. The Star Spangled Banner had been played on occasion at other sporting events going back to the late 19th century. One of the Red Sox ballplayers, Fred Thomas, saluted the flag during the song. Thomas was serving in the U.S. Navy at the time. Players from both teams followed his example while fans sang along. The crowd cheered and clapped at the end of the song. It was a hit. The Star Spangled Banner was played at each of the following games of the series, starting a tradition at sporting events that lasts to this day. Teams faced travel limitations because of the war. For Game 4, the teams returned to Boston the very same day they had to play. Ultimately, Boston won four games to two behind the dominant pitching of Babe Ruth and Carl Mays. The Cubs failed to score on Ruth in Game 1. He also won Game 4 while Mays was victorious in Games 2 and 6. Some now believe that the Cubs through the series. They lost on purpose. This was, after all, the year before the infamous Black Sox scandal when some of the Chicago White Sox players did indeed lose the series on purpose to the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, in 1918, the Cubs did have a much better record than the Red Sox. They had dominated the National League, winning by more than 10 games over the second place team. They also committed five errors over the course of the series. For the series, winning ballplayers received $1,103 which is about 18,377, that's really specific for an about, in 2018, while the losing players were paid 671 per player, 11,179 today. Although a sizable amount of money, it's pretty small, it's minuscule actually, compared to the modern standards of professional sports. Ticket sales for the 1918 series were lighter than expected due to scheduling limitations caused by the war. In the early 20th century, Many players felt that owners took advantage of them with low pay and benching players when they were close to earning performance bonuses. Players also resented the reserve clause, which basically prevented free agency, and that's a whole long story in itself. Currently, there's no documentation proving that Chicago purposely lost the series. But this was an era when hippodroming, where players colluded with their on-field opponents and gamblers to decide games beforehand so they could make extra money, was not unheard of. That's true, and other than the Black Sox scandal, um, Heine Zimmerman and Hal Chase, they were... They were blacklisted and blackballed from organized baseball, um, even though they weren't officially, officially convicted of throwing games, but people knew. By the end of the Great War, some of the biggest names in baseball had served in the U.S. Armed Forces. Christy Mathewson, Red Faber, Harry Heilman, Ty Cobb, and George Sisler, who are all Hall of Famers, they all served. African-American players also fought in the war, despite enduring the racism of segregated baseball. That's true, they didn't play in the major leagues, they played in the Negro Leagues in the United States. Uh, tragically, baseball players faced the same carnage that other soldiers experienced. Some died in action, while others were killed in training or lost their lives to a fatal disease. During a training exercise, Mathewson, and Christy Mathewson, one of the, one of the greatest pitchers of all time, uh, he was accidentally gassed. Once a top physical specimen and commanding pitcher, he suffered from breathing problems, including tuberculosis, for the rest of his life. He died prematurely in 1925 at the age of 45. He was a member of the first class inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. The Great War forever changed the national pastime, American sporting culture, and the World Series, making the 1918 series one of the most interesting contests in the history of the Fall Classic. If you need more information or have any questions, 
if I need more information, I have it all in my head. Or have any questions, please let me know. But I will stay in contact with you. I like other baseball fans. Well, that was great. Flo, what do you think about that? That was great, yeah? <laughs> yeah, Germans in baseball. Funny enough, though, one of the earliest mentions of baseball uh, is from a German children's book from the 1790s. And it's, it's, I don't know if I'll get the grammar right, but it's Der Englische Baseball. There was a great episode about America's pastime. If you'd like to see an episode about one of America's other pastimes, alcoholism, you can click right here for our special about Ernest Hemingway. And you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, and I'll see you next time. And I'm sure I'll see some of you in the comments after saying that.